أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فجاءته إحداهما تمشي على استحياء قالت إن أبي يدعوك ليجزيك أجر ما سقيت لنا, لنا صدق الله العلي العظيم عطر أفواهكم وزين مجالسكم بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh If you've spent any time on social media over the past couple of years You've probably come across the term high-value woman. Now, in pop culture, a high-value woman refers to a woman that possesses certain distinctive traits. A high-value woman, through a pop culture lens, is described as a woman with high self-esteem, a woman who is confident, who is comfortable in her own skin, a woman who is financially independent, a woman who is ambitious, a woman who prioritizes self-care, and ultimately, this is a woman who would be considered marriage material. Now the question is, from an Islamic perspective, what are the qualities that a woman should possess in order, to her, in order for her to be high value in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the Islamic perspective on this notion of being a high value woman? Now of course, this lecture is by no means going to be exhaustive. I just want to mention certain qualities that I feel are lost in this day and age. That Islam places great value on, but modern society might not give enough attention to. Now, what is a high value woman? Now, when you look at the Quran, first and foremost, the first quality of a high value woman is her iman and her taqwa. We have to understand, brothers and sisters, that even if the entire world puts you up on a pedestal and celebrates your praise, and even if every human being on earth considers you high value, if Allah doesn't consider you high value, you're not high value. The first quality of a high-value woman in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is iman and taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, 
verse 2, 21. He addresses the believing men. He says, وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنُ Allah addresses Muslim men. He says to them, and do not marry polytheistic women until they have faith, until they accept faith. And then what does Allah say? وَلَأَمَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكَةٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, O believing men, do not marry a polytheistic woman until she becomes a believer, until she has faith. And then Allah says, Verily, a believing woman who is a slave, who is at the bottom of the socio-economic ladder, is better than a mushrika." even if that mushrika is desirable to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is highlighting what? A woman who has iman and taqwa, even if she is at the lowest level in society, in terms of her income, in terms of her social standing, in the sight of Allah, she has more value than a woman who doesn't have taqwa and doesn't have iman, even if she's the CEO of a company. Even if she's a superstar, an actress, even if she has all the resources of the world, Allah says, the woman that has iman, that has taqwa, has more value. Now, of course, the purpose of this lecture is not to say that some people don't have value and others do. The point of this lecture is to emphasize that all human beings have a baseline dignity that is afforded to them by virtue of them being from Bani Adam. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. Every human being has a certain degree of dignity by virtue of being human. But this lecture is not just about the baseline dignity, it's about high value. The one who has high value is the one who is connected to the ultimate source of value. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what does Allah say in the Qur'an? He says, Man kana yuridu Whoever wants honor, whoever wants value, whoever wants dignity, if you want value, where is it? Where do you find dignity? You want value? You want honor? Honor, value, dignity, it belongs to Allah. If you don't have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't have How can you have high value when you are disconnected from this ultimate source of value? <coughs> Taqwa is important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, what does he say? Walillahi al Allah has honor. Izza. Walillahi al izzatu Wali Rasuli. Rasulullah has honor. Walil mu'mineen. And this honor is found in the believer. So therefore, first and foremost, and some of the traits that I'm going to mention are going to, are going to also apply to men. And tomorrow night, I will speak about what is a high-value man. I know some sisters are wondering what, what's going to happen with the guys. Tomorrow we'll speak to the brothers. But tonight, we begin our discussion by highlighting that first and foremost, the most important quality in a woman is her taqwa. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ If you don't have taqwa, you don't have high value. I don't care how much money you have in your account. I don't care how big of a social influencer you are. You might be famous on earth, but you are infamous in the eyes of Allah. You are infamous in the assembly of the malaika. We have to pay attention to this. Taqwa. Number two, from an Islamic perspective, a high-value woman is a woman who embraces her femininity, her feminine energy, not feminism, huh? Because I tell you, brothers and sisters, there is nothing that has been more destructive to femininity and feminine energy 
then feminism, especially a feminism that's completely divorced from divine values. A high value woman is a woman who embraces this feminine energy. It's a woman who understands that I don't need to be like a man to have value. I have value in my femininity. You know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about marriage, when He speaks about the coming together of a man and a woman, He mentions the purpose of marriage. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا The purpose of marriage is what? For one partner to bring sukoon to the other. The husband provides tranquility to his wife by, do, by being what? By, being, by having that masculine energy, by being provider and protector, because that is what gives sakina to a woman. What gives sukoon and sakina to a man? To have a wife who has that feminine energy, who shows that love and that aff- Because I tell you, love is not enough for a marriage to survive. Each couple has to come into the marriage with the mindset, how can I bring sukoon to my husband? How can I bring sukoon to my wife? Maybe I need to help, a little, help out a little bit more at home to bring sukoon to my wife. Maybe I need to stop nagging my husband about these small trivial issues so I can bring sukoon to my husband. Sukoon has to be the goal. This is the purpose of marriage. If there's no tranquility, there's no marriage. Many love marriages have fallen apart because they don't know how to translate their love into sukoon. A high value woman recognizes that Allah has given you the greatest gift. And that is your femininity. That's a gift from Allah. Every home needs that feminine energy. Every man. A man cannot have peace and tranquility unless he has that sukun in his life. Unless he has that feminine energy. There's a beautiful hadith from the Prophet where he speaks about a woman who had that feminine energy, that intuitiveness, that nurturing side, that affection, that empathy. A man needs that. So Allah subhanahu so the Holy Prophet says, there's a hadith that says, a man came to the Prophet. جَاءَ رَجُلٌ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ A man came to the Prophet. فَقَالْ now this man, you know, many a hadith when a husband is coming, usually it's bad news. My wife is this, my husband is that. This hadith, alhamdulillah, this is a husband who is praising his wife. He says, Ya Rasulullah, inna li zawjatan. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I have a wonderful wife. What's so wonderful about your wife? He explains, inna li zawjatan, idha dakhalt talaqatni. Ya Rasulullah, I have a wife that when I come home from a long day of, or at work, she receives me at the door. She welcomes me. Welcome home. There's love from the moment he steps in. There's warmth. إِذَا دَخَلْتْ تَلَقَّتْنِي وَإِذَا خَرَجْتْ And when I leave, she doesn't say, Alhamdulillah, I hope he leaves forever. <laughs> and some husbands, unfortunately, they conduct themselves in a way where Maybe this dua has been made multiple times in your marriage. He says, وَإِذَا خَرَجْدْ شَيَّعَتْنِي He says, and when I leave, she goes to the door and she farewells me at the door. There's this love, this affection. And then he says, وَإِذَا رَأَتْنِي مَهْمُومًا And when she sees that I'm distressed, so this is a woman who's intuitive. She's not in her own world. She can recognize if her husband is distressed. وَإِذَا رَأَتْنِي مَهْمُومًا قَالَتْ مَا يَهُمُّكَ She asks me, what's distressing you? And then he says, she would say to me, 
إن كنت تهتم لرزقك فقد تكفل به غيرك. If she see, Ya Rasulullah, when my wife sees me distressed, she asks me, what's distressing you? And she says to me, if you are worried and you are distressed about your rizq, about money, she says, don't worry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provider. My dear sisters, do you know how much your husband needs to hear this? I don't think many women understand how much stress a man carries in his heart every day. Because our value is inextricably linked to our ability to provide. We're always thinking about that. How are we going to provide? This husband that you might think doesn't love you, believe me, he's thinking about how to give you a better life, how to make you and your kids more comfortable. It occupies so much of their brain space that for him to hear this from you, that I, I see that you're working hard. Work hard, but let your heart be at rest because Allah is the best provider. You want to save your marriage? Say this. Believe me, it has a huge effect. And then she says what? She would say to me, وَإِن كُنْتَ تَهْتَمُّ بِأَمْرِ آخِرَتِكَ but oh my husband, if you are worried and concerned about your akhirah, then may Allah increase your concern. These words of comfort, these, these nurturing words, these uplifting words, to remind, to have someone in the house who has that spirit, who has that warmth, who reminds you of what is the ultimate goal in life. This is a high-value woman. And this is not me. Now you might wonder, why is Sheikh Azhar giving a lecture on, who is Sheikh Azhar to give a lecture on high-value woman? You're right, I'm nobody. But Rasulullah is somebody. Quran, Quran, Ahadith. We, we, we're drawing these lessons from them, from our teachers, from our sources of guidance. So what does the Prophet say when he hears this? فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ اللهم صل على محمد He says to this man, he says, go and tell your wife something. Deliver a message from me to her. بَشِّرْحَ بِالْجَنَّةِ Tell your wife that have the glad tidings of Jannah. Because this feminine energy that you have, that you bring to the household, Allah's reward for it is Jannah. Because you're creating a peaceful home. Bashirha bil Jannah. And then what? Rasulullah has something else to say. He says, Wa qullaha, and say to her, this is a message from Rasulullah. Say to her, Inna lillahi ummalan wa hadhihi min ummale. Tell her that Allah in this world, He has agents. And she is one of Allah's agents on this earth. Laha nisfu ajr shaheed. Just for being like this. Just for being intuitive. Just for lifting up the people in her family. Showering them with love and mercy and warmth. Rasulullah says, for her is half of the reward of a shaheed. This is. This is a high-value woman. A high-value woman doesn't live with her husband like, I'm a roommate with you, right? You scratch my back, I scratch your back. As if it's some sort of business transaction. And do you know what Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi says? <laughs> there are some women who have such a beautiful presence that they can bring comfort to you without them even speaking. What does Amir al-Mu'mineen say? He says, when I used to come home to Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam, he says, وَلَقَدْ كُنْتُ أَمْرُ إِلَيْهَا فَتَنْكَشِفُ عَنِّي الْهُمُومُ وَالْأَحْزَانِ Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says that I used to just look at Fatima. 
Just, just, Fatima doesn't have to speak. She has this beautiful feminine energy in the house that just by looking at her, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, all of the sorrow and the grief leaves my heart. This is, this is what Islam teaches us. Not radical feminism where you, you feel like you're not living with a woman anymore. You're living with another man. This doesn't bring sukun to a, a, a marriage. So the second quality of a high-value woman, in addition to taqwa and iman, is to embrace this gift that Allah gave you, where your mere presence can uplift people. Your words can rejuvenate hearts. Embrace it. Remember always, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى The man is not like the woman. The male is not like the female. Number three, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. We would, this would require multiple lectures. But just as a quick overview of some of the most important qualities. Number three, a high-value woman is always interested in learning and developing her spirituality. She's always interested in learning. She's not satisfied with mediocrity when it comes to her Islamic knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mujadila, He speaks about the effect that increasing knowledge has on us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْ مِنْكُمْ Surah 58, ayah number 11. يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ Allah elevates those who have iman. Now after faith, there is something else that allows you, con- to, uh, allows you to continue ascending. Iman will elevate you. But after you have Iman, there is one thing that will allow you to go higher and higher in your proximity to Allah. What is it? يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ If you want to have value in the sight of Allah, you need Iman. But in addition to Iman, if you want to increase your value, you have to increase your knowledge of the sacred. You have to need, increase your knowledge of Allah, Ma'rifatullah. If you look at the women of Ahlul Bayt, the women of Ahlul Bayt were not ignorant. How did Imam al-Sajjad salam, describe Sayyida Zainab salawatullahi alayha? He says, Amma, O oh my beloved aunt, Anti bihamdillahi alima ghayra mu'allama. O oh my aunt, all praise be to Allah who has made you an untaught scholar. We need to dedicate time to deepening our knowledge. And we need female scholars. We really do. There are some problems that really require a female perspective. There are many sisters that might have questions, but they might be too embarrassed to reach out to a male scholar. We need female scholars. And this was the role that Sayyida Zainab السلام, was playing in Medina. The women would go to her. She was the female version of Imam al Hussein, with her knowledge, with her understanding, with her spirituality. You have to make this a goal, this is important. It's not enough to just get a master's degree in finance. It's not enough to get a PhD in gender studies. I hope it's not gender studies. (laughs) Where is your Islamic knowledge? Where is your Islamic knowledge? If this was 150 years ago, maybe there's an excuse for ignorance because maybe there's not enough material that's available in the language that you speak. But today, is there an excuse for jahl? Is there an excuse for ignorance? There's not. Do you know, brothers and sisters, probably the greatest companion of Imam al-Sadiq was Zurara. Zurara, Imam al-Sadiq says about him, if it wasn't for Zurara and the like of Zurara, the teachings of my father, Imam al-Baqir, would have been lost. Zurara originally was not Shia. How did he become Shia? His older sister, his sister, Ummul Usud, 
as Shaybani. She took knowledge from Abu Khalid al Kabuli, one of the students of Imam Zainul Abidin. She took knowledge and she converted her entire clan. And her brothers are some of the greatest transmitters of ahadith. Because of Ummul Usud as Shaybani, because of her love for knowledge, much of our ahkam from Ja'far al Sadiq reached us because of how she converted her own brother. You have to put a premium on knowledge. There should not be a single day, a single week that goes by that you're not increasing your ma'rifah, your understanding of your deen. Number four, a woman of high value is a woman who is mature. We have an immaturity problem these days. A woman of high value is a woman who is mature. Even if someone speaks badly of her, she doesn't stoop down to their level. If she is in a gathering where there is gossip, unfortunately, ghiba, gossip, is a big problem, especially in gatherings where there are ladies, with all due respect. It's like the snack of the majlis, right? We have baklawa, we have tea, and we have ghiba, right? The three of them, the unholy trinity. Gossip. A high-value woman does not gossip. She does not stoop to that level. She does not denigrate. She does not tear down other people. And if there is gossip and riba being spoken in her presence, she carries herself with grace. She, if she cannot stop, she changes the subject. You know, sometimes people might be too embarrassed to call out riba. Okay, don't call it out. Change the subject. Someone wants to start gossiping. Say, by the way, did you read this hadith? By the way, did you see what happened you know, on the news? Change the subject. Allah will reward you for this. Because you are rescuing your fellow mu'mina from committing a great sin. And don't get involved in the he said, she said. A woman of high value does not insert herself in drama. She's above that. Allah, when He speaks about His true servants, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّهُ مَرُّوا كِرَامَ they, When they see idle talk, they just keep on going. They don't engage in it. They don't assume the worst of people. Oh, this person didn't invite me to the wedding. Assume the best of people. Maybe she doesn't hate you. It's not, it doesn't need to always be war. Maybe, maybe they had a legitimate reason. Assume the best. What happened to giving 70 excuses? Maturity. A woman of high value is a woman of maturity. And a woman of high value, if she's not able to correct immoral behavior, she distances herself from those who she cannot change. She's not antagonistic. She doesn't get into every single fight with every person. No, no. She's very selective about her time. She's selective about what she talks about. Her words are measured. She doesn't gossip. She doesn't backbite. She doesn't mock. She doesn't ridicule. A woman of high value is a woman of maturity. Number five. A woman of high value treats everyone with kindness and dignity, irrespective of who they are. Even if she doesn't have a social media account. Maybe she's a nobody on Instagram. Maybe she doesn't come from a prominent family. But a woman of high value treats every person with respect. There's a beautiful story that... A woman came to Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. This woman, she came to Lady Fatima alayhi salam and she was a poor woman. And she came to Fatima alayhi salam and she had questions about the rulings of salah. Her mother was confused about some ahkam of prayer. So she asks Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Again, Fatima is the daughter of the Prophet. And this woman is basically 
Someone who's not known, doesn't come from a, a famous, a noble tribe, just an ordinary woman. She asks Fatima to Zahra some, about some clarity, to give some clarity about some issue relating to the rules of Salah. Fatima to Zahra explains it. She didn't understand. So she asks the question again. Fatima to Zahra explained it a second time. The woman still didn't understand. She asked a third time. Fatima to Zahra tried to simplify it even more. The woman still was confused. The narration said she repeated the question ten times. And Fatima to Zahra did not make her feel stupid. She did not make her feel small. She did not make her feel like she's burdening the daughter of the Prophet. In fact, the woman, she was apologizing to Sayyidah Fatima. She's saying, O oh daughter of Rasulullah, I apologize. I'm burdening you with my questions. I'm not understanding. Fatima to Zahra, she says, it's not a burden at all. She says, would it be a burden if someone gave you a hundred thousand dinars to carry a heavy load from one level of the house to the other? It would be easy because of the prospective reward. Fatima to Zahra says to her that for every question that I answer that brings you closer to Allah, Allah gives me the quantity of pearls that will fill what is between the earth and the arsh of Allah. The point is, Fatima to Zahra never looked down on people. Don't look down on people. Yes, she's not as popular as you. She doesn't come from a noble family. She doesn't have as much money as you. She doesn't have an advanced degree. She's not as pretty as you. She doesn't have as many friends as you. Right? Maybe she doesn't speak English properly. Don't look down on her. Have humility. Be kind. Be kind to all people. The Prophet was rahmatan lil alameen. We're not asking you to be rahmatan lil alameen, but at least be a rahmah to the people who are around you. Be a mercy to them. Number six is a high-value woman is modest. This is an important quality for both men and women, but it's especially important for women. Modesty in the way that you dress and in the way that you conduct yourself. And it's possible for someone to dress modestly and to behave immodestly. It's not enough to wear abaya. You might be wearing full hijab. But the way you speak, the way you talk, the way you interact is immodest. And there might be someone who is modest in their conduct, but they're not being modest in their dress. Allah requires both. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about female covering in the Qur'an, what does He say? He mentions khimar, which is the headscarf. He mentions jilbab, which is a loose article of clothing that covers and conceals the shape of a woman's body. Of course, this aspect of hijab, unfortunately, is rarely upheld. And I know some people get irritated. Oh, another lecture about hijab. This is, this is Amr bil ma'ruf wa al munkar. If anyone in our community is not upholding the laws of God, we have a duty to one another to remind each other. You're my wali and I'm your wali. We have to take care of each other. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَ Allah is saying that we have to remind each other. Who are you and who am I to get frustrated or annoyed about the fact that certain aspects of Islam are being, they're being emphasized because the spirit of hijab has been lost. When Allah speaks about modesty in the Qur'an, it's not just about the female covering. There's an aspect of the hijab that is neglected today. So yes, khimar has to be there, jilbab has to be there. But what does Allah also say? وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا One of the most important aspects of hijab is not to display your adornment in front of non-mahram men. And that means what? Wearing, and I have to repeat this 
twice, wearing makeup, lipstick, eyeshadow. That's all that I know. I don't know beyond that. I know there are a lot of other things that go on. Lipstick, eyeshadow, whatever it is, eyelashes, eye extensions, eyelash extensions. All of this is haram in front of non-mahram men. It's a sin. Every moment, you, when you walk out of the house with makeup, you are committing a sin. You are violating the Quranic injunction, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ in fact, this is such a big issue that Allah in the Quran, when He speaks to elderly women, Surah 24, Ayah 60, Allah is referring to old women who are sitting at home. A woman who's in her 80s, in her 90s, who was not sought out for marriage. No one is interested in marrying her. She's an old woman. Allah says what? There is no blame upon you if you cast your garments. Meaning that she can uncover her hair. She doesn't have to be too strict about covering up to the wrist. She can show her hair. She can remove her khimar. But what does Allah say to that elderly woman, the 80-year-old woman? غَيْرَ مُتَبَرِّجَاتٍ بِزِينَةٍ Allah says to the 80-year-old woman, you can take off your khimar, your hijab, but without displaying your adornments. Allah in the Quran is saying what? An 80-year-old woman is not allowed to wear makeup in front of a non mahram How about a 20-year-old girl, a 30-year-old girl? This is a sin, brothers and sisters. Now you may say, oh, it's just makeup, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal, because the laws of Allah are a big deal. You are belittling the laws of God. And I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy to walk out of your house without makeup. I know. I know it's difficult. But do you know what we need today? We need, and I pray that this happens in my lifetime. We need some sisters to come forward and to start a no makeup campaign. To empower other women. To not feel that they have to wear makeup when they leave the house. To look acceptable. Because there is nothing better than natural beauty. There's nothing better than that. It's good for your skin. It's good for your bank account. And more importantly, it is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wear makeup. But wear makeup in front of the right people. Wear makeup. Wear lipstick. Wear the eyeliner. But wear it for your husband. Today it's the opposite. At home, the makeup is off. When I leave, so my husband gets no makeup. And all of the other men in society get what? They get the makeup. They get the zina. This is the opposite. This is the opposite, brothers and sisters. Your zina should be for your husband, for your father, for your direct family, not for non-mahram men. I know this is unpopular. Of course, this is an unpopular thing to say. But the member of Imam al-Hussein is not for, it's not a popularity contest. It's about upholding the halal of Muhammad and the haram of Muhammad. <laughs> so khimar, hijab, no adornments. And another aspect of the female covering that's ignored today or overlooked is exposing the feet. Covering your feet is part of the hijab. So if you're walking outside with sandals and your feet are showing, you're exposing something that has to be covered. What's the big deal? Why? Because Allah said. Because Allah said. How come you don't ask why is Salat al-Fajr to a rak'ah? Why do we have to go seven times? Because Allah said. Allah has a wisdom. That should be the answer. And that should be enough. It should be enough that your Lord and Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad have said that the feet ha should be covered, that's enough. If you cannot sacrifice, if that's too difficult for you to do, to cover your feet, then what is this majlis about? The companions of Imam al Hussein, they gave their lives for Islam. They sacrificed everything. Some of us are not even willing to sacrifice and e expose ourselves to a little bit of discomfort. We have to remind each other. 
So the modesty has to be there in terms of dress code. And also when it comes to conduct, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the daughter of Shu'aib? Allah describes the way that she walks when she comes to Musa. فَجَاءَتْهُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِ عَلَى اسْتِحْيَا Allah says she was walking bashfully. Allah praises this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that haya to be there. He wants that modesty to be there. Your beauty is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a blessing. Make sure you don't use your beauty to defy Allah. You know, there's a hadith that says that Maryam alayhi salam, now we all know that Allah gave Yusuf unprecedented attractiveness. There's a hadith that the same hadith also tells us that Maryam had unprecedented physical beauty. The hadith from Imam al Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi. He says, Yu'ta bil mar'atil hasna. On the day of judgment, a beautiful woman will be brought forward. Yawm al qiyam, on the day of judgment. Alati qad iftutinat fi husniha. A woman, an attractive woman, will be brought forward on the day of judgment who fell into sin because of her beauty. You know, when you're attractive, it's natural that you want to show off your beauty, you want to display your beauty. And sometimes your beauty can lead you down a path of haram. So what is going to happen to this attractive woman on the day of judgment? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she will say to Allah, Ya Rabb, Hassan ta khalqi. Oh Allah, you made me beautiful. It's not my fault. Ya Rabb, Hassan ta khalqi hatta laqitu ma laqi. You are the one who made me attractive and beautiful. And that's the reason why I fell into sin. I was overwhelmed with the temptation, with the desire to show off my beauty. The hadith says, فَيُجَاءُ بِمَرْيَمْ عَلَيْهَا salam." Maryam, the mother of Isa, will be brought forward. فَيُقَالْ أَنْتِ أَحْسَنْ أَمْ هَذِي This woman will be asked, who is more beautiful, you or Maryam? And the woman will say that Maryam is much more attractive than I am. And Allah will say what? قَدْ حَسَّنَّاهَا I gave her beauty, but she didn't fall into sin like you. She was modest. What's your excuse? Maryam was more attractive than you. Why was she able to observe modesty, but you weren't able to? So Maryam becomes a hujja against all those women who adorn themselves and fall into sin because of their beauty. I want to end with this, my dear brothers and sisters. There's a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He says, Kam wala min rijali kathir. He says, Many men have attained spiritual perfection. Walam yakmul min al nisa'i illa arba. But among women, there are four who have attained spiritual perfection. Asiya bintu Muzahim, Maryam, the daughter of Imran, Khadija, the daughter of Khuwaylid, and Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. <laughs> These four women are women that the Prophet describes essentially as being high-value women. If you look at each of them, they're unique. In Islam, the beautiful thing about Islam is unlike Catholicism, for example. In Catholicism, Mary is the ideal woman. She's the perfect woman. But the problem with Maryam in Catholicism is that the role model, the model of female perfection in that tradition is unattainable. Why? Because you can never be a virgin mother. You have to transcend your own biology to be Maryam. But in the Islamic tradition, Allah gives us what? The Prophet gives us four models of female perfection. The first is Asiya. Asiya 
is a model of female perfection. When you look at Asiya, you know, there are a lot of women who are trapped in abusive relationships. I'm not saying that you should stay in an abusive relationship, but the reality is sometimes you cannot leave an abusive relationship. You're trapped. Asiya alayhi salam was married to who? She was married to Fir'aun. Do you think Asiya could divorce Fir'aun? She was trapped in that marriage. She lived in a prison with the most tyrannical man. And you find that even in that palace which felt like a prison for her, she was able to attain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through her patience. Through her patience. And if you look at her dua at the end of her life, look at the sacrifice of this woman. She was willing to give up a life of luxury to support Musa. She's being put to death. Her last dua is what? My Lord, build for me a house with you in paradise. She doesn't say a palace. She's, she's living in a palace now with Fir'aun. She says, oh Allah, I would be content with a house next to you in Jannah. Allah rewarded her for every moment of suffering with that tyrannical husband. Asiya is the consoler of every woman who is trapped in an abusive relationship. Sometimes you can get out, but other times you can't. You're like Asiya. There are many women who will never be able to taste the pleasure and the enjoyment and the blessing of motherhood. Asiya wanted to be a mother, but she didn't have children. But she took advantage of what was available to her. She couldn't be a biological mother, so she became a spiritual mother to Musa. You might not have biological kids, but find someone to mentor, to nurture. You can be a mother to a young girl who needs guidance. You can be a nurturer. You can help people, even if you don't have biological kids. The point is that Asiya alayhi salam, she did the best with what was available to her. And in fact, if continuing the narration, then we have Maryam. Maryam alayhi salam, of course there are certain aspects of Maryam that are beyond emulation. You can't be a virgin mother. But Maryam represents that high value woman who sought nearness to Allah through extensive worship and supplication. In fact, in the temple in Jerusalem, Maryam had her own mihrab. كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَ الْمِحْرَابِ وَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقًا She found peace in her communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, how can you... And her worship of Allah was never interrupted. Now, if a woman in the Islamic tradition, in our fiqh, even if a woman is experiencing her month monthly cycle, it is still mustahab for her to do wudu and sit on her musalla and do tasbih. Don't cut off from your ibadah. Follow in the footsteps of Maryam. Don't ever disconnect yourself from the worship of your Lord. Maryam salam is also that high value woman who was slandered. High value women are slandered sometimes. But did she get into a shouting match with the Israelites? She left her reputation in the hands of Allah. And Allah elevated her through the mu'jiza of Isa When you look at Khadija salawatullahi alayha. When you look at Khadija, you find that Khadija السلام, becomes that model of female perfection, the role model of that woman 
who wants to seek nearness to her Lord through engagement with the world, through charity. Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam uplifted, lifted many people out of poverty. Islam doesn't say that you, you can't own a business or you can't be an entrepreneur, but be like Khadija who never allowed her business to take her away from her family duties. Yes, she built a business empire, but she prioritized her family when she got married. And she used her wealth to help the vulnerable, to help the disenfranchised. Khadija becomes a role model for that woman who seeks the good pleasure of Allah through charity. And then you have Fatima to Zahra, salawatullahi alayhi Who is the embodiment of the virtues of all of those women? Fatima to Zahra, Ummu Abiha, the mother of her father. And who was her father? Rahmatan lil alameen. She was the mother of Rahmatan lil alameen. She was. A woman who chose a life of simplicity. She was the daughter of the Prophet. She could have lived the most luxurious, the most comfortable life. But she chose a life of simplicity. A life of zuhd. We don't have very much in terms of ahadith from Fatima a.s. But Fatima teaches us. She is that model of female perfection that shows us you don't need to be in the limelight to change the world. You can change the world from your home. It's not about how much you do in your life. It's about the sincerity with which you do it. The greatest gift that Fatima to Zahra gave to humanity, you know what it was? It was Hassan, Hussein, and Zainab. There is no Hussein without his mother Fatima. There is no Hassan al-Mujtaba without the tarbiyah of that woman. There is no Sayyida Zainab without Fatima. Do not underestimate the sacredness of what it means to be a mother who can raise revolutionaries, luminaries. Do you know what the legacy of Fatima is? The legacy of Fatima are the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Fatima to Zahra has a share in the reward of all of the Imams. Everything that Jafar al Sadiq did, it goes back to Fatima. Everything that Zainul Abidin did, it goes back to Fatima. And everything that Sahib al Asri wa Zaman will go back. To the matriarch of Ali Muhammad, Fatima al Zahra, salawatullahi alayhi. That is what it means to be a high value woman. You can be a high value woman without compromising your modesty. You can be a high value woman even if you live 18 years. Because it's not about how long you live, it's about the depth of your life. On this night, we commemorate Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, who became the man that he became because he had a high-value woman in his life, and that is his mother. If you have a high-value woman in your life, you should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing. Whether it's your mother, your grandmother, your wife, your niece, your daughter, your granddaughter, if you have a high-value woman in your life, Allah has blessed you immensely. On the day of Ashura, Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi is standing. But at the beginning of the battle, he's standing across from Imam al Hussein. Hur was under the understanding, he thought that his mission was to simply intercept Imam al Hussein and prevent him from entering Kufa. He thought, as far as he was concerned, that the military operation is finished. 
But on the morning of Ashura, Hur, he looks around and he sees more than the 1,000 men who came with him. He sees an entire ocean of soldiers descending upon Karbala with swords, with spears, with arrows, thirsty for the blood of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Hur, he turns to Umar ibn Sa'ad and he says, Amuqatilun antahada? Are you really here to kill Hussein? To shed the blood of the grandson of Rasulullah? I thought that this was just a matter of preventing him from going to Kufa. Umar ibn Sa'ad says, Yes, and we will not leave a single one of them alive. Al Hur, he begins to tremble. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you had to make a big decision, a life-changing choice? Hur is trembling. He looks around. He looks at the men behind him. He looks at the family of Rasulullah in front of him. He begins trembling. One of his companions says, Hur, why are you trembling? Are you afraid? You are one of the greatest warriors of Kufa, of Arabia. What is wrong with you? Are you afraid to die? Are you afraid of battle? He says, La Allah. I, I was never the type of man who was afraid of battle. I am afraid of something much more serious. I see myself choosing between hellfire and paradise. Wala akhtaru ala al jannati shay'a. And I will never choose anything above paradise. At that moment, Hur has a choice to make. Does he do what is easy and continue to get his paycheck from the Umayyads? Or does he do what is right? And oftentimes to do what is right is not easy. He was a military commander, a decorated military commander in the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. He decides at the last moment to change sides. He mounts his horse, Ya Mu'mineen. He places the Qur'an on his head. He covers his face and he charges toward the camp of Aba Abdullah. As Hur is approaching, they're not able to identify him because his face is covered. He was ashamed of Imam al Hussein for what he had done. He is the one who blocked Hussein from Kufa. So he goes towards Abi Abdullah. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, Man ant, who are you? His face was covered. He was embarrassed to show his face. Look at the answer of Al Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi. He doesn't say that my name is Hur. He was so remorseful and so ashamed that he introduces himself by the sin that he committed towards Imam al Hussein. Abba Abdullah, I am the man who blocked you from Kufa. I am the one who caused your family distress. And he says to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, carrying that guilt in his heart, he says, Fahal tarali min tawbah. Ya Aba Abdullah, do you forgive me for what I did? On this night, all of us, we go to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and we say, Aba Abdullah, we're tired of ourselves. Ya Aba Abdullah, I want to change. Ya Aba Abdullah, I messed up in my life. Ya Aba Abdullah, I don't pray. I don't wear the hijab. I mistreat my parents. My mother died 
and she was angry with me. We come to Imam al Hussein with that trauma, with that guilt. Imam al Hussein, what does he say? Without a moment of hesitation, without holding any grudge in his heart, he says, Ya Hur, in Tubta Tab Allahu Alaik. O Hur, if you repent, Allah will accept your repentance. He says to him, Aba Abdullah, since I was the one who caused so much agony to your family, give me permission to be among the first to lay their lives down in front of you. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he gives him permission. The narrations say that he mounts his horse. He goes into the battlefield and he fights valiantly with every ounce of energy that he has until he gets overwhelmed by the enemy and they strike him with a fatal blow. And as soon as they hit him, he cries out to Imam al Hussein. He cried out, Aba Abdullah Adrikni. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he rushes to him. He holds the head of Hur in his lap. He wipes the blood from his face. And do you know what he says to him? He has a private conversation with Hur. He whispers to Hur and he says, Ma akhta'at ummuka in sammatka hurra. Oh Hur, you had a good mother. Your mother was not wrong when she named you Hur. Because Hur means to be free. And you released yourself from shaitan. And Hur, his soul leaves his body in the lap of Aba Abdullah al-Husayn. 